Namaste. So now we're getting to the section on the four types of self-realization or the four paths of spiritual development leading to enlightenment. This is where things start getting really good. <laughs> the whole first section, the first like 14 chapters are really about the cosmic creation, how it all came into being and the different parts and how they relate to one another and so on. This is ontology. It's called Sankhya in the scriptures. Sankhya means discrimination, but it's actually a whole spiritual path in itself. And she's going to mention that in this 15th chapter. 15th chapter, she talks about basically the background of spiritual life. 16th chapter, she talks about Shankhya and yoga. And then the path, the ultimate path of total surrender, she doesn't speak much about till the 17th chapter, but that's all the 17th chapter is about. So we can see from the way she divides up the material that this uh, fourth method of self-realization is actually the most important. So what are they? Well, the first one is karma yoga, good old karma yoga. And she describes how to follow the rules and regulations of Varnashram Dharma. Varna means occupational duties and ashram means the stage of life that you're in. So there are four occupational duties, Brahmana or spiritual teacher or priest, Kshatriya, warrior or administrator, or generally ruler. Vaisha, a business person, and Shudra, a worker. So actually, almost everybody is a worker, maybe 90% or more. And then a few percent are business owners, tradesmen, like that and a smaller percentage are warriors or administrators of the government. And finally, there's a tiny, tiny percentage of people whose only business is spiritual life. Learning, doing sadhana, and teaching, performing ceremonies like managing temples and things like that. These are Brahminical occupations. Now, the thing that's wrong with Varnas being assigned by birth is that people are of varying qualities. So it's not that a Brahmana qualified person is always going to take birth in a Brahmana family and vice versa. It's not that all the children in a, vice, in a Brahmana family are going to be qualified Brahmanas. So for this reason, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Chatur Varnyam Maya Shrishtam, Guna Karma Vibhagasaha. I created these four divisional occupations in life and they are uh, separated or classified by Guna, quality, and Karma, work. And Karma also refers to the birth chart. So they, every, every newborn child should have their astrology chart read by a qualified astrologer, and they can determine what is the appropriate work for that being. Of course, this system is in complete disarray, even in India. So uh, due to the influence of outsiders, foreigners, uh, it has become by birth only and this is sometimes mistakenly called jati uh, or janma by birth. But Krishna doesn't say janma jati vibhagasa. He says guna karma vibhagasa. So anyway, uh, maybe by the next Satya Yuga, people will have it figured out. But moving on. The four stages of life are brahmachari or student life, 
Grihasta or householder life, Vanaprasta or retired life, and Sannyas or renounced life. And not everybody is qualified for Sannyas, especially if they're not a Brahmana by inclination uh, or training. But the first three for sure. While one is a student, one should be celibate to retain the information that one has learned, not scatter your brains all over. Uh, <laughs> and then in household life, grihasta life, one should have and raise children. And when that's finished, then one should retire. Vanaprasta means forest life, actually. One should go to the forest, get out of town, and devote your life to spiritual culture. So this is karma yoga in a nutshell. This is really the basis of it. And then she talks about Sankhya. Well, a large part of the beginning of the book is actually about Sankhya. Sankhya is actually ontology. Ontology means a catalog or a matrix of the type of phenomena that can exist. And of course, a system of terminology to describe those phenomena. Basically, it's a model of reality. And this model enables one to understand cause and effect. So by studying uh, Sankhya or ontology, one creates a model of the universe in one's mind that actually allows you to predict the effects of different causes. Now, the problem with Western ontology is that it's based on material science and it's in complete denial of the power of consciousness. And of course, we know from studying Vedas, consciousness is Brahman. Consciousness is God. And it's particularly the Shakti form of God. So whenever we worship Shakti, although there may be some name and form involved, those are purely symbolic, metaphorical. The actuality is Shakti is consciousness because look, Everything shows up in consciousness. The whole world shows up in consciousness. Even God shows up in consciousness. So just see the scope and power of consciousness. When consciousness changes modes, like from waking consciousness, jagra, to dreaming consciousness, uh, at night, when we go to sleep, everything changes. That the whole world of Jagra goes out the window <laughs> and the whole new world of Swapna or dreaming comes in and has completely different rules and so on and so forth. So we can understand that consciousness is actually the thing that, as far as we're concerned, brings the world into existence by its different modes. So then the third method that she talks about is yoga. And she divides yoga into meditational yoga, the conventional yoga of eight limbs, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. And then the other limb of meditative yoga is sangyama, Sangyama is also discussed in the commentary on Lalita Sahasranama. And it is the external ritualistic worship of the goddess. So this can be of any form or any name, or it can even be of the Vishnu forms or whatever. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> the point is that one is committed to doing good deeds that do not harm any living entity. So we have yoga here divided into internal and external. The eight limbs of yoga are completely internal and the sangyama rituals are external and quite elaborate. But 
the ultimate goal is the same in both. In Patanjali Yoga Sutras, he says, the aim of yoga is to understand chit shakti. And chit shakti is described in these chapters in some detail as different from prakriti, which is what the Sankhya is about. But let me just return to Sankhya for a minute. How is Sankhya a form of yoga? Well, the Buddha also taught Sankhya. And the way he taught was that one should meditate on the different elements, the 22 or 24 or 27 or 32, depending on which version of Sankhya you follow. But let's just take a, a simple one, earth. First, what is earth? It's solid, it's solid matter. It has resistance, it's impenetrable. Huh? like stones, very resistant to penetration. So the idea is one should become mindful or aware of the earth element in one's existence, both in the body and in the external world. And then see how that is not the self. <laughs> that is not what we're really looking for. And then the same with water, which means liquid matter, air, gaseous matter, fire, plasma, huh? or dissociated ionic molecules. And finally, akasha, or space, because everything that exists has to occupy some space. But even that is not the self. The self is what is aware of all these things. And that's the real point of Sankhya. So once you get that, you accomplish the same goal as yoga, either internal or external yoga. But it's still not the same as the fourth method. The fourth method, well, the way she describes it is so wonderful that I want to quote it here. Now listen to my description of the fourth method called complete renunciation. It consists of the adept's abandonment of every task, however weighty or trifling. Having been thoroughly burnt by the fire of worldly existence, he resorts to me alone. When with unwavering mind a person resorts to me, I permit him to identify himself with me after his mind has become rid of all sin. So this is a wonderful capsule description, which she elaborates greatly in the 17th chapter. In fact, the 17th chapter is the longest chapter in the book so far. It's over 100 verses. It'll probably take 30 minutes just to read it. So uh, this method of self-surrender means that having experienced life in the material world and noting that it's completely unsatisfactory. It's temporary, it's imperfect, and it's not self. Therefore, one takes refuge in the transcendental Lord, either the male form, the Purusha form, or the Shakti form, the female form. And what does that mean? To take Complete shelter? Well, it means, first of all, that one does not count on anything from the material world. One does not count on good activities or bad activities or neutral activities <laughs> to save one. You see, this is such an inner state. It has to do with our expectations, how we view the world. It's a very deep transformation to say that, okay, nothing in this world can please me. So I'm going to take prapati, full surrender, take full shelter at the feet of God and goddess. See, and look only to them for salvation, not even to any works that I might perform. And, well, in a nutshell, what she's saying 
is complete renunciation, sannyasa. That's what that means. San means all, everything, and permanently, sa. And nyasa means, in this context, giving up or sacrificing. So by sacrificing or giving up everything, then one can take full shelter of her. And at that point, she takes responsibility for the devotee and guiding him from within and without, gradually leads him to the ultimate realization of complete enlightenment. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. <laughs>